This is Sunday, May 28th, 2017. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Charles Fosberg. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? March 28, 1931. And where were you born? Framingham, Mass. What community do you currently live in? Natick, Mass. Your marital status? Married. Do you have children? Yes, five children. Grandchildren? Ten grandchildren. Great-grandchildren? Uh, Thirteen great-grandchildren. All right, before the interview, you said that shortly after you were born, your family lived in Wellesley, and then you moved to Natick in 1935 in an area known as Polkville. Can you describe Polkville? Well, Polkville, we, we were really lucky here in Polkville. In fact, right here, my parents owned this land here, and it was 15 acres. And the, we had a cow pasture here. We had horses, a few horses and cows. And a lot of times the guys would get together and would play either baseball or football up in the cow pasture. But most of all, down where the Natick Armory is, it was a nice field, it was an open field. And that's where uh, the restaurant is there uh, right now. But that was a baseball and football field. And right fr just after that, we had a nice convenience store called Chuck Corners. And it was a nice convenience store. And, and on that building, they had uh, the B&M bus stop. So it was a good size, so we would hang around at the bus stop a lot when, after we'd get through playing ball. Or, and then right across the street, which is named now as Paul Eno Memorial Park, that's we would hang, go there and hang out for a while after playing ball, but during the summer, we would walk down. We call down to Walsey College, and we called it the creek. It, we called it the cable, and we had a cable in the off uh, off of uh, one thirty five where the water runs down into Lake Warbin while it was in the woods. And in it, we had a beautiful cable, a nice little beach, it was a little beach, and that's where we'd go swimming. But to go swimming, you couldn't wear any trunks. So it was all boys, all fellas, so that's where we were. Uh, so we had the swimming down there in the hot days. And then the other day, like baseball, so we had a baseball games. Football games was all down at the uh, Natick Armory, right there. And skating, we would burn the meadow. What we're doing back at the Natick Armory, we had the big meadow there. We would burn that down like in September. And we'd burn it down pretty short. And then we would block up the dam right across where Georgie Longs used to be on Union Street, we'd block up that dam. And then when, no, then when November came, the middle of November, the meadow, at that time, I mean, 80, 80 years ago, we really had some bad winters, the meadow would be frozen. And by Thanksgiving, we were playing hockey there. So during the winter, we had a skating summer Ball, we have football, baseball, so everything was very. We never, the only time we'd go downtown really would be to go to the theater or go to Casey's Diner. And uh, because we had everything right here, there was no need of, uh, no need of us to go downtown. Sounds like a great childhood. Oh, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful, and there was a lot of kids here. We must have had, you know, probably 25, 30 kids. It was a large neighborhood. Everybody at that time had a pretty good sized family, so we were lucky we had uh, good good sportsmanship here. Okay, Charlie, let's advance a little bit to December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Do you remember that day? Yes, I do, very plainly. 
was on a Sunday. My mother and father was moving furniture. We were born brought up right here. I mean, like, brought up right here in the house. And my mother and father was moving furniture, and they had the radio on. And uh, they come over, and I was in the house help when they were doing it. And I had my two older brothers at that time, Bob and Ed. I really don't know what they were doing. But I remember my father and mother, when they heard the news, they said, oh, oh my God. And I remember my mother starting to cry. And that time I was 10 years old, and I didn't know what was going on, really. And then they explained to me, we had just gone to our meaning the bad people were attacking us. And, but I, I certainly do remember, I, I remember plain as day that when my parents kept all, all shook up over it. And I remember that very, very, very well. Now you have, you are not the only child in your family. How many uh, siblings did you have? I had two older brothers, Bob and Ed, and my younger brother, Paul. We had, uh, there was four boys in our family, no girls. And uh, were they, old, the older brothers, were they old enough to go to war immediately or were they waiting a couple more well, years? Wait, they waited, um, I think they went in the service in uh, 43. I'm not quite sure, but I think they went in the service in uh, 1943. Bob would be, Bob was born in 1925, and Ed was born, I think, in 1927, so they were at that age. Okay, Chuck, in the meantime, can you tell us a little bit about the life on the home front? Well, we, we were, We'd go to school every day, naturally, and then after we were busy. Uh, like uh, here, we had a farm, and my father's my father's mother lived with us, and she was paralyzed. She was crippled. She had to walk on crutches, and she was along in years. And and over here, this field here, was all a big victory garden. The whole thing was uh, all victory garden. And my mother and father were, were working, and I was in Lincoln School here, and I'd come home at noontime, and uh, I would uh, be busy. I'd get my grandmother, because like, she couldn't get around. She'd be out weeding the garden all day long. And I'd get her a, a quart of cold water and four or five slices of bread with butter on it and bring it out to every noon time. And then when after school, we'd get through school a quarter to three in the afternoon. So I'd come right home, had to change of school clothes naturally. Mm -hmm. And I'd do the same, I'd, get, I'd check on my grandmother. And uh, because my two older brothers, they, they were working part time, I think probably at Lookout Farm or one of the farms. And uh, so I'd do the same, and then after that, I could uh, go and play. I, I'd probably have a little chores to make sure doing something, but on that, we'd go and play. And uh, we were always, always on the go. I mean, you didn't hang around. If you wanted to uh, get some money to go to a movie on the weekend, You'd have to go pick apples or pick blueberries, like Alfie Hanna, which lived over here. He had a big apple farm, and uh, Bill Hanna, his uh, grandson, Bill Hanna, and I would go pick apples, and then we'd go uh, sell them for Alfie at uh, one of the local stores. So we were always doing something. Uh, you weren't laying around, that's for sure. Which was good. You didn't have television. All you had was a radio, so you were never in the house really. But Do you remember anything else about home front, like rationing, or gas rationing, or yes? In fat? fact, in uh, fact, I still have uh, a rationing book uh, for your gas. You had an A, 
I think A, you'd get like say five gallons of gas a week. And I think if you had a, a book with B, meaning you'd travel a lot, you'd probably get like 10 gallons of gas a week. And uh, our food, we, like I say, we were very lucky with the big garden we had here, because my mother would can canned food, like a lot of stuff. Everything was fresh right out of the garden. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd go down to Chuck Horner's and, you know, and get the uh, bread. Uh, we had chickens here, we had cows, so we were, we were really lucky. We were lucky that way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but rationing, you didn't, you you didn't like throw away your shoes when you had uh, a hole in the bottom of your sneakers. You put a cut out a piece of cardboard and put a piece of cardboard in there, to, and uh, your clothes. You try to wear them until you couldn't wear them anymore. And uh, but it, it was a lot of stuff like your parents would want. My uh, my father never smoked. Mother at that time didn't smoke, but she smoked later on. But uh, to try to get uh, something special, uh, you, you really couldn't. You couldn't get uh, special uh, vegetables you'd want or uh, anything like that. It was very, very hard. You had to have the coupon books, and you had to be careful, you know, what you bought with that to last you... Uh, for the week or whatever the book would run through, the, but other than that, uh, it 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 was it was scary. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. It was scary. Uh, do you remember blackouts? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You did. You had to have your shades down so at a certain time at nighttime. You had to have the shades down, and uh, you definitely couldn't. Uh, have any lighting outside or uh, any any uh, stuff that they they could see uh, if you were outside walking you'd have uh, my father wasn't in the service he was a civil service and he uh, like they uh, would have to go around they'd have duties to go around night times and we to check neighbor neighborhoods to make sure there was no fires going, no, they couldn't see any lighting. And uh, that's what he did at that time. And did your school ever conduct scrap drives? Yes, yeah, Lincoln School did. It was, uh, you'd have to, you know, bring in, you'd get cans and bottles or whatever you could get, metal, especially metal, and uh, uh, leather, and uh, You'd, you'd, every so often you'd uh, bring them in. And then what we did, we had uh, a stamp book. And uh, you'd get, uh, try to get 10 cents a week to buy a stamp and put in that book. Mm -hmm. And that book, I think, would add up after it was full. I think, I, I'm almost sure, I think that book added up to like $2.50, something like that with a, so. That was for the uh, helping with the war bonds. You had war bonds. You're mentioning the Lincoln School, and this is not the Lincoln School that most of us remember. This is the previous Lincoln School, yes. which was the original high school. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. What was that like? Oh, that that was, they that it was a real, <laughs> it was a, a beautiful building, all wood, not in um, like a mahogany wood inside. And uh, like the boys' room, you go downstairs, and it was like in the boiler room, and that's where you had your trough in that. You go down, yeah, you had troughs down there, the trough, and that's where you'd you'd go to the the bathroom, and uh, then it was a slate roof, and geez, a lot of times these slates would start falling off, so they'd have to they'd put rope all around the outside for that was a playground so you couldn't play over there and uh, kind of the slate would be <laughs> the slate would be sliding off all of a sudden you'd be out there playing you'd hear some watch out you could hear it starting to slide and uh, but it was it was really quite a building it uh, 
the bottom, you know, was like three floors because down below was the boiler room was way down, and like I say, the girls' room was over one side. I can't really remember, but the uh, boys' room. I remember that's where the custodian we call him a janitor then, but his office, his little room was downstairs near the uh, boys' room, and uh, so that's how that that place was laid out. And for those who aren't quite familiar with the original Lincoln School slash original high school, it is where the Verizon building is now on the corner of 135 and Grand Street. Yes, yes, yes. it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how did you uh, keep track of what was happening overseas? Did you have the radio? By radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, they... Uh, you, you, you ask um, I rolled the brothers. They they were up on that, and uh, like they'd fill me in, and uh, tell me how, how bad it was, or stuff like that. And uh, so that's you'd you'd always be with somebody, and they all we, most of us had older brothers at my age when growing up. We in the neighborhood there was a lot of older brothers and. And they'd uh, let us know. Uh, and then naturally, a lot of them, most of them, all of just about all of them went in during World War II, and uh, would find out through their families, you know, how uh, things were. Now, this is uh, your older brothers were Robert and Edwin. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they went in around 1943. I was going to say around 43. Okay. I was going to say. And what branch did they go into? Uh, well, both of them were in the Navy, but when Ed got through basic training, uh, they put him in the Seabees. So Ed was a Seabee, and he ended up uh, in Guam. And how about Robert? Bob stayed in, Mass uh, in the States. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where was his uh, station? Uh, I think I think he might have been Illinois. I think that that's around Great a, Lakes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think yeah. I wasn't too familiar with being in the the army <laughs> with him. Okay, so er, I take it you got out of Lincoln Elementary eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and did you attend Coolidge? I did. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Natick High School. I went to Natick High School and then I quit. And then I, I, got, I was in, then I, I quit school and then I joined the service. I, we were, to, there was two of us. Jim Fahey, that was, uh, he grew up in Marion Street down, the, just down the road. And in fact, I was talking to Jim on the telephone. He lives, it's funny with that, we joined in 1948 together. And we took our basic train to down Fort Eustis, Virginia, both of us. And then we got separated. And Jim ended up, in fact, it was funny, I ended up with three years, and Jim ended up with 30 years. In fact, we were just talking, he lives down Newport News, and he, he took his basic in Fort Eustis, and he got discharged in Fort Eustis 30 years later. Really? Yeah, 30 years. Yeah. He was uh, Chief Fahey's uh, younger brother. Wow. Yeah. So let's uh, roll it back a little bit. So the war ended when you were in Natick High School? Uh, yeah. Uh, or? Uh, no, it ended before. Okay. So you're yeah. probably in Coolidge. Yeah. Yeah, because I joined, I turned 17 and I joined in 48. Okay. So. So what was that like hearing the war was over? Oh, it was great. In fact, I remember we were playing baseball down uh, down the end. We, were playing, we had a ball game. We were playing baseball down the army, down our ball field. And it come over. And I think if I, if I remember correctly, it would come over in the afternoon. And geez, the cars were peeping. The, everybody was yelling. And we were playing baseball. And we said, geez, what the heck is going on? You know, with all the noise, mm -hmm. and uh, I do remember. I remember very clearly that. Mm -hmm. 
How about a couple of weeks before when the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on Japan? Did you kind of yeah. know what was going on? We, we, we didn't know what. We said, geez, they had a big bomb. They did something, but we had no idea. Nobody had any idea that the, the atomic bomb, even the people that were working on it didn't know that that's what they were making. And uh, But when we heard it, that uh, how many people it killed, and I mean, at that age, we said, geez, geez like 100,000 people, my God. We thought at that time it was millions of people that mm -hmm. it killed, but really. Now let's go back. Uh you're 17 years old, you decided to leave Natick High School. Mm -hmm. uh, was it just to join the military? Well, what it was, it was funny. Jim and I were sitting on the common. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Jimmy wanted to get out of Natick. Jimmy, for some, didn't like Natick. He said, I just know, I want to get out of Natick, and that's it. So we both met him, we said, why don't we join the Army? Well. We had to get consent from my parents because we were 17. And uh, I said, geez, I was working part-time down the Wellesley Press at that time. And I said, you know, I said, that's a good idea. Why, why don't we do that? So I went to my parents, my mother and father, first my mother says, is this what you want to do, is go in the army and that? And I said, I think so, ma. I said, it would be different. I said, uh, I said, everything's free, <laughs> you know. And I said, Jimmy wants to go. I said, Jimmy wants. So she said, see what Jimmy's mother says. See what Mrs. Fahey thinks of it. And uh, so if I remember correctly, I think the, the two mothers called each other. And, talked, and then finally she said, okay, I'll give you this. And the next day we went into Boston Army Base and we signed, you know, did our thing and that. And then the next day we went back and I think we'd see the next day or the two days later, we went back and we shipped out. We went to uh, Fort Eustis and that, that was the start of it. Now you have a younger brother named Paul. Uh, hmm. Was he in the Army or was he He was still... in the Army, yeah. He was already in the Army, okay. He, he went in the Army quite a few years after I got out. Oh, okay. Yeah, Paul, uh, he, was, uh, he was stationed over in Germany after he was, he was in Germany. I think Paul, if I remember correctly, uh, I think Paul was in for five years. Mm -hmm. I think he stayed in for five. Okay. Let's get back to you. You've just signed. You're in Boston, and you just got into basic training in Virginia. Uh, was this the first time you were away from home? Uh, yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. In fact, to be honest with you, uh, when uh, we were on the train going down, I had to have somebody show me how to tie a necktie. Because I never wore neckties. I don't like neckties. I don't wear them <laughs> unless for a funeral or something. But uh, I know in the army you had to wear neckties. And, uh, so I always remember somebody, I know it was Jim or whoever it was, I said, Jesus, I said, You're going, somebody's going to have to show me how to tie a necktie. <laughs> yeah, that was something. Oh, I had to charge out of that. So tell us what basic was like. Basic was pretty hard. Well, we were lucky. We only did uh, eight weeks of basic, which I understand they do. It's longer now, uh, but we that, Virginia during the winter is, uh, and even during the summer that it's, it's not that warm, and. Uh, when you'd be out in the rifle range early in the morning, like six o'clock in the morning with a M1, a lot of people would get M1 thumbs. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, stuff like, in the, in the march and in the, uh, in the drills, some of the uh, hikes we did, you know, uh, you know, a 15 mile hike and stuff like that with a backpack on, you know, and it was, stuff like that was, uh, but, and then too, 
being a young young fella, you know, like 17, 18 years old, you're, you're in pretty good shape, you know. You're, I mean, you could handle it. I mean, it wasn't easy, but you could still handle it okay. And uh, But we did, did a lot of that. We did an uh, infiltration course, which was hard. That's when you crawl under the wire and they have the machine guns firing over your head. And they were live ammo, too. And uh, geez, that time I, you had to do it during the daytime and at nighttime. And at that time I had a boil on my knee. And I, and when I got through crawling through, that, that boil was just gone. But there was like a nice hole down around the knee. And I, that that was against me there, that, that really hurt. And I had to do it at nighttime too, but I had a bandage on it wasn't that. But uh, the infiltration, I mean, it was at that time was scary, you know, because uh, you crawled, uh, you, you know, you was crawling under the the wire, and uh, they kept saying, "Don't lift your head up, don't lift your head up," because it was having lives ammo going over you. But uh, drilling, you did a lot of matching, a lot of drilling, a lot of drilling, a lot of hiking and uh, stuff like that. But uh, other, uh, other than that, it wasn't too bad. It really wasn't. Uh, like I say, it was only eight weeks, so right. we were lucky. So what happened after BASIC? I went into called TC, Transportation, and uh, was all vehicles, you know, semi-trucks, Jeeps, and uh, can uh, they, we had a few uh, tanks, but uh, not. We didn't really have the tank. We had the like semis, and the uh, jeeps and stuff like that. And uh, I was in the harbor patrol down in Virginia. We were in my company. We were in the harbor. Uh, TC. What was it? Hundred tenth. Hundred tenth harbor. Patrol, I think it was called. Really forget it. And uh, in that s section, we had uh, one, uh, one or two boats. And every so often, you'd have to go out there and do your duty on the boat for like three days and uh, learn on the uh, tugboat. It was a tugboat, really. And uh, you'd have to do your duty out there for a while, a few days. We, I did it a couple of times, and that was it, not that often. And uh, that was it. Uh, it was just a, just a regular sort of, like I did a lot of driving, a lot of driving. The, uh, we'd have to go to different camps to uh, with stuff they needed. Uh, we'd have to pick up. Then we had the, uh, like I say, it was in the uh, motor pool. In the motor pool, I drove a Jeep. I drove a lot of Jeep a lot of times for the old man. The and old man being? Company commander. And then uh, you will say uh, I was in the galley quite often with, uh, when I was on planes. But it's on special service a lot with baseball and football so and then when that wasn't going on they'd throw me in the uh, in the kitchen just to get in the way of a cook the, the cooks you know <laughs> you know do dishes and pans and stuff like that that KP. was only yeah no like a kp mm -hmm. you know <laughs> but it was nothing really i'd only be in there a short time because i was always doing something. And how long were you stationed down there? I was there, <laughs> I'll tell you a good one. I was supposed to get discharged in July, what was that? I think 19, I mean, I think it was July 27th or 28th, right around that time, supposed to get discharged. And the day I was supposed to get discharged, went down to get discharged, but there were so many being processed out, they ran out of money. So we had to go back. We was going to get discharged the next day. 
I always remember, I'm, I can see it right now, there was like four or five of us left in our barracks. We had turned everything in, uh, bedding, everything was in. The only thing we had was just our bedding. And it was going to be processed out the next day. Well, a good buddy, Harry Truman, come over and said, all personnel are extended for one year. So they added one more year on to me which uh, were at that time was pretty disturbing, being supposed to get out and didn't get out. Uh, but we had to go and get everything back again. And uh, then uh, football started up, a practice started the season. So at that time, I broke my ankle playing football. So I get shipped in to the hospital. I was in there for, I think, three months because I was useless with a cast on my leg. And at that time, the war had broken out. In my company of battalion, we got transferred from TC Transportation into the infantry, into 6th Infantry. They took, and I was in the hospital, and at that time, my company, pretend, got shipped out to Korea right away. They got shipped out right down to San Diego. And uh, I think they went down there, I think in November, November of 50, I think it was. So I was supposed to go there with them, which I was in the hospital, they didn't. So when I got, they had gone to Korea. And uh, when I got out of the hospital, I think it was, geez, was it after, it was after, it was close to Christmas. And uh, I found out words of the, you know, my, everything was uh, in the uh, barracks and in another place in uh, Fort Eustis. And uh, when I was there, uh, they gave us a furlough to, to go home for Christmas and that. And uh, then when they got back, they uh, we did a lot of drilling. I had to learn the infantry way because in the TC you you did nothing like that. Really, you didn't do any of the stuff like the infantry. So we had to learn that. And uh, then it was in March. Uh, I got engaged to Norm, yeah. and then in March, we got orders there, we were being shipped out, so we figured we was going to Korea. So they gave us a five-day leave to come home, and uh, we everybody, but then when we got back, they told us we were being shipped to Germany instead of Korea. We was going on the standbys over in Germany. And I got stationed in Berlin. And while we were there, my time was running out. Now I'm on that extension. So we got there in March, and I only had, I by the time, and then that went into baseball season over there. So uh, at the end of March and then April, so it's like on specials. I drove the company commander over there, and they played baseball. <laughs> so. Uh, then when July come around, I get the good news of uh, my time was up then, and so we could. Uh, but that was it, and then get shipped back home. Mm -hmm. Let's take a step back. Uh, when you were stationed in Berlin, this is only a few years after the city got devastated. Mm -hmm. It had been pretty much divided before you got there. Tell yeah. us what uh, going through Berlin it, was it, like. Berlin was still a mess. Mm -hmm. it, it really was, the, it was still, yeah, a lot A lot of the sections were all boarded up. Uh, even uh, the big buildings you'd see, they were all boarded up and they'd have wooden fences that have uh, like stockade fences all around and that you'd be walked about every I'm going to say 50 to 100 yards that have a door 
through the uh, board where the fence is, and uh, you could see if you're working in there, that would be the entrance and work in there. And then what we did over there uh, sometimes, I, I did a few times, would uh, take the uh, prisoners out and would work them on their uh, work detail. And uh, it just let there did be mowing, mowing lawns or uh, raking or cutting up the stuff. They uh, mm -hmm. not, had no bother with them. You'd okay. take a detail probably about eight, eight prisoners mm -hmm. and wherever you had to go, they would uh, do what they had to do. And by prisoners, were they German prisoners of yeah, war? Ger mm -hmm. Yeah, German prisoners. They mm -hmm. yeah, still had them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Did you ever deal with the locals? Uh, yeah, we used to, we had uh, some, some of the people we met, German people, were uh, good people. They, 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 they weren't Nazis. They weren't Nazis. They weren't mean people. Uh, you'd uh, would go to nightclubs and that, and uh, you'd you'd meet some in there, and they were uh, friendly. Mm -hmm. I mean, they I don't know if they had to be or what it was, but I mean, still they had no bother with them. Once in a while, you would hear uh, some of the bad guys. They'd. Uh, try to start over. You had some that really started, wanted to bring a Nazi back in, you know. But uh, they'd be taken care of, you know. Uh, like in uh, I, May Day, was there in May Day, that, that's a tell. And we left the parade, we had the big parade we, from Berlin. We'd start at the uh, Berlin airport. And uh, that was a big time. That, that was communist. Mm -hmm. And uh, on my on my jeep, we had a electric electric cable, and it was hooked up under the jeep. So when we started the parade, I had to take that electric cable. It wasn't that long, and drop it down onto the ground. It was hooked in to a, a wire, a battery wire, special hooked up because the communists at that time. They, they were pretty bad. So in the parade, the parade was really big. Anybody that came near, touched that Jeep, would get knocked right on their fanny. And because years before, they had an awful time. So the uh, Jeeps, we did, uh, every one of us, I mean, there was an awful lot of us. And uh, that's why, in case any of them come jumping out, try to get near you. And, uh, but other, other than that, uh, no, no problem, and I uh, can always remember we were getting ready uh, to go get ready for the parade and everything. And I had this buddy of mine he's from Worcester. We used to call him Red O'Brien, and he came to me and says, "Chuck, he said I got bad news for you," and he was telling me one of our buddies that played football with us got killed, and uh, I said, "Thanks." <laughs> And uh, so he lost him. And uh, he said, I'll see you later on. But uh, after that, that was the last, that was the last time. He was being shipped out because he re-enlisted. And uh, that was the last time I saw Red. Oh, and, wow. Uh, he uh, was a good kid. He was a hot ticket. Mm -hmm. Really a red-headed kid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've been, your, your time is up. Uh, were you being discharged in Germany or back home? No, come back home and mm -hmm. uh, get out Camp Kilma. I get discharged from there. And where is that? Uh, New Jersey. New Jersey, no. okay. And what rank were you at the time of your... I was PC. PC? Yeah. Okay. So, but I, I, didn't, I could, didn't make rank because really when you're on, not in with the old man that much, I mean, by that, you're playing football or baseball, you know. You're supposed to be a soldier at all times, you know, and some of them don't go for it, believe me. And uh, But most of them do, but mm -hmm. my company commander down in Virginia, he he was a soldier all the way, and uh, 
He didn't care for his boys playing sports instead of being a soldier, ah. you know. <laughs> so. Now, you but, mentioned your brother Paul earlier, and he was also stationed in Germany. Uh, where was he stationed? Gee, well, he had told, it, it, I know it was in Berlin, I know that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he might have been in Hamburg. Hamburg, okay. I, I think he was in Hamburg. And did he do anything? He he was uh, security, I think. Okay. I'm almost sure Paul. That's what Paul did. I, I, not quite. He he was gone when you know we were married and. Soon as he he was young, I, geez, I think when he turned seventeen, he he enlisted, because he, he he hated school. He didn't want any part of school. So if I remember correctly, when Paul was like seventeen, he and he I know he went overseas. Uh, he was over there for a long time. I know he was there at least three years overseas. Okay. All right. So you've been discharged. I take you got back to Natick. Yeah. And when I left, you know, I was working the Wall Street Press part time, mm -hmm. and they like say we got married when I was in the service, and uh, now I'm got pregnant, and uh, we uh, when I got discharged, I uh, w went back to work with the Wall Street Press, and because that's where I was working part time when I left, and. Uh, we worked there for uh, 25 years, and then uh, after that, I worked there, I was still working there, and I said, geez, i got to get something with security. So I went and worked for the uh, town of Wiles school department for the town of Wellesley for, uh, I was there for 23 years, and that time, I, uh, when I was still there, I turned 62, and I said, I I said, geez, I said, I think I've had enough of this. So I took an early retirement. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they needed a, a, a part-time custodian at the Wellesley Library. And uh, so I got a job. A, a, the head man there was a friend of mine, John McAvey, from Natick. And he was a head man there, and uh, he hired me as part time. So I worked there for the uh, library for town, uh, Walsey Library. The two small outlets, the uh, one down Walsey Hills and one uh, down mm -hmm. Western mm -hmm. Road. So we cleaned them. I took care of them in the morning for eight years, and uh, it was great. And then there's going to build a new library, in, uh, which I did. So John had quite a few years in, as being head man at the library. He said, Chuck, he said, when they tear this down and stop building the library, he said, I'm retiring. So I said, John, if you're going to retire, I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to stay if you're mm -hmm. gone. So, which he did. And at that time, it uh, just said, what was that night? 2000, 2001, something like that. Mm. They just started building the native golf course. So I said, I'm going to go see the guy up there. They just started building, working on it. So I went and uh, he said, you sure? At that time, I was like 70, I was 71 years old, I think. And I said, I, I can handle it. And he said, all right. So he hired. So I was there for four years, and they helped build that, the Natick golf course. And what I would do after we get it done, every morning I would go in at seven o'clock and cut the greens. So that was my job. So I did that for uh, three years. I'd go in and cut the greens and get through like 10 and 10.30 in the morning. And so I did that for, th then I, uh, that was the end of it. I think I think I turned like seventy five then when I quit. I said, no, I said my back starting to give up. <laughs> so that was like the end of it. After you left, did you join any service organizations? 
No, they wanted me to uh, join the uh, reserves of that. I, I didn't. Because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like I say, she was pregnant and we are married. And I said, no, I, I said, mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, VFW, American Legion? Uh, yes, American Legion. I'm sorry, yeah, it belonged to American Legion and the Natick Hulks at that time. But as I got older, I uh, I started giving it up. I, uh, did you have a chance to use the GI Bill in any way? I did. I bought my house with the GI mm -hmm. Bill. Yeah. Yeah, I bought it in uh, 1950, 51 after I got out. Okay. Did any of your children uh, join the military? No, no, no. no they, mm -hmm. well, thank God they didn't have to. Jack, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Oh, I thought it was very important. <clears throat> I wanted, I, I, I figured eventually, you know, after there were so many soldiers that were getting discharged, and God bless them all, they got killed too, they were going to have to start drafting. I figured because it was being so, so many, so many of the military was getting discharged. And uh, then naturally, uh, we didn't know, and then, then the Korean War broke out, and uh, I, I, I was glad. I, I mean, I figured we'd, we had a lot of fun. So, we, you know, you, had, you met a lot of good buddies, and you had a lot of fun. And you lost, I lost quite a, not a quite a few, I lost some in, in Korea. And I had a lot that, like Paul Ian, a good buddy who grew up with me, I lost, you know, you lost him. And uh, then we had some uh, good friends that ended up being really bad, like Billy Higgins from Natick. Billy was in tough shape. And Ralph, uh, geez, oh, geez, I forget. He died a few years back. He, he was shot up bad in Korea good friend of mine. So, we, you know, you see those fellas and you see even, you see a lot of, a lot of the fellas now coming up, like my uh, granddaughter, who she married one of the fellas that was over, two tours over in Iraq and he had a t tough time of it. Yeah. So you see a lot of the young fellas uh, it's tough. Just a couple of months ago, uh, you and your brothers were honored by the town of Natick with uh, Memorial Square. Uh, mm. Tell us what that was like. Being cold and freezing and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was very nice. I give the Natick Vets, the Natick Council, Natick Veteran Council, uh, Paul Carew, Eddie Jolly, uh, Pat Young and uh, Chipper Sinclair and all those fellows, they do a great job. And they they do a great job for the veterans in town. Paul, Paul does a wonderful job. He's involved with an awful lot of veterans organizations. And I'll tell you, we all appreciate it. I mean, you, you really appreciate it. Like, you know, when people come up and talk to you about it, and it's really, it's, it's an I'll put it, it's an honor, you know, to uh, have served, and it's really uh, a nice feeling when somebody comes up and shakes your hand and thanks you. It's like I remember uh, I was wearing a veterans hat, and my daughter and her husband have a place up in uh, Waterboro, Maine, and my son-in-law was out golfing that. In fact, it was Fourth of July weekend. We we're golfing. Jeez. I didn't even think of it. I had the veteran's cap on it, my golf cap, and and uh, saying a veteran and that. Jeez, I had about four or five different people when we get close to, on the tee and uh, walking by, come and sh shake your hand. And never saw them before in my life. And just walk by and shake your hand and say thank you. And so that's a nice feeling. Yeah. Chuck, is there anything else before we wrap this up? 
Uh, no, thank you, Maureen. You're doing a, a, you've done a wonderful job, and I appreciate it. And I want to thank the Veterans Organization in Natick. I think they're, they're a great organization. The fellas and the ladies have done one heck of a good job. It, it's, I, we're very lucky in Natick to have these people doing what they're doing to help us veterans. It's a great feeling, mm -hmm. and I want to say thank you. And thank you, Charles Bosberg, for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project.